It's my pleasure now to welcome Mary Shaw, who is uh, Alan J. Parley's professor of computer science at uh, Carnegie Mellon University. And I could say many things about her, and her biography is indeed very big and uh, relevant to, to our community. But, uh, you know, I, I'll just say that she's an example to be followed by the community. and. Uh, she'll bring a new perspective on modularity uh, to, to us today. So I'm pleased to welcome her and would like to ask you to, come to, to welcome her too. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I guess the microphone is on because I can hear it. Um, thank you for, for that introduction. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Um, I've, I've been here for a day and a half now, and I've enjoyed the conference, the beautiful beach, the interesting people. I'm looking forward to the swimming pool tour. Uh, <coughs> um, am I? St yes, I'm still here. Um, the, um, several of the organizers of the conference uh, encouraged me to talk about modularity. Um, they said that AOSD here at the point of being 10 years old is uh, at, at the, uh, the sound's coming in and out. Is that right? Um, so the organizers uh, uh, encouraged me to talk about modularity uh, because they said that uh, you're looking for uh, fresh, uh, fresh ideas about research areas and modularity. And so I, I took that challenge and called the talk Modularity. So let's talk about modularity. Um, what is modularity? Well, <clears throat> modularity comes from modular in a suffix that means, uh, 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 let's make an abstract noun out of it. Um, and so modularity is the state of being modular. Right. Modular is an adjective. It means uh, related to or based on modules. Good. That means let's talk about modules. Uh, module is a noun, and it means a standardized uh, component, often an interchangeable component, uh, of a system that's designed for easy assembly or flexible use. That sounds right on target, doesn't it? Uh, or it may be a self-contained component used in combination with other components. These are alternate definitions. These are two definitions targeted at the same thing. This is not either this or that. And <coughs> cruising around examples of modules, I don't need to read these to you, but they, uh, they follow the same kind of template. They say it's a piece. It's a discrete self-contained piece. Um, it's a piece that may be assembled with other pieces. Um, and these come from various domains, and so the pieces have to do with what's in that domain. And you'll see that they're defined, so we went from modularity to modular to module, and then module is defined in turn um, in terms of uh, other words that mean discrete parts. Uh, component unit, part, portion, assembly, but they share the property that the module is intended to be combined with other things. And they share, at least implicitly, the idea that the module has some constraints about, that, about its use. So modules are intended to be used in particular ways. They're not just parts taken at random. And the precise nature of the element, uh, what's in the element, depends on what it's intended to be used or possibly reused for. Um, now, all of this is probably essentially familiar, but words mean a lot of different things to different people, and it seemed like it was a good idea to start with modularity. One of the first things that comes out of this is that to talk about modularity, you need to talk about modules. So let's focus on modules. Um, modularity, um, as defined here and, and as exemplified by, by those uh, examples on the previous slide, 
uh, show an application of one of our favorite computer science heuristics, which is divide and conquer. <clears throat> Take your problem and chop it up in pieces. Uh, we're really pretty good at the chop it up in pieces part. Uh, <clears throat> we sometimes forget that after you've chopped it up in pieces, you have to put the pieces back together again. And, <clears throat> and so our, our methods are sometimes much more robust about the divide part than they are about the conquer part. So you chop it up in pieces and put them back together again. Uh, but you know how hard that is uh, because aspects are particularly challenging uh, to weave back together again. So what I want to do today uh, is to offer a framework for describing modules and by offering a framework for describing modules, providing a basis <coughs> for discussing modularity uh, in order to open a discussion about modularity in general and uh, about new opportunities for this community. Well, we got from modularity to module. Why do, why, why do we do this? Uh, what's the point of modularizing? Looking across the board at modularity schemes and methods, it seems to me that there are three general classes of reasons for modularizing. One is to gain intellectual control of a problem. One is, one is to segment work. Uh, and one is for the purpose of evolution and reuse. So uh, we're trying to gain intellectual control. We uh, do, for example, uh, localized representation so that we can separate decisions, um, so that the decisions can be changed with minimal disruption to other decisions. Um, we may separate concerns to enhance understandability. The system is easier to explain um, and, and to understand and therefore to maintain. Uh, we may use standard architectures to reuse design knowledge. Uh, when we're segmenting work, and I, and I think Jim Herbslem is going to talk about this later, we localize decisions to separate responsibilities so that different people can work on parts of the project. Uh, to match work assignments, different people are doing things. Um, and to factor tasks <coughs> to organize them around bodies of knowledge. Um, so you, so if, if astrophysics is a big piece of what you're doing and your entire staff doesn't understand astrophysics, then you may segment the work so the astrophysicists deal with the astrophysics. It's cutting in and out, isn't it? <laughs> uh, this will work. Hello? Got sound? There once was an aspect-oriented developer from Recife. <laughs> and, and you can go on from there. Um, intellectual control, segmentation of work, uh, evolution and reuse. And we're now down to evolution and reuse. Um, if you localize decisions, you simplify change. And so you may modularize for the purpose of, of, of e making changes easier. Uh, you may have standard units that support reuse and substitution, and you may do this because you're trying to cultivate a market for the reusable parts. Okay, so, so three general classes of reasons uh, for, for doing uh, modularization. This is not a new idea. Uh, it goes way back in history. The Examples that we most often hear about are modularization for manufacturing, that is, interchangeable parts in manufacturing. Uh, the usual example, at least uh, in the United States, is, is Whitney's uh, um, reusable parts for assembling firearms. Um, it turns out that the actual demo was a bit of a charade. They had gone through a lot of different parts and picked out a subset of the parts that actually were interchangeable in order to do the demo. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, Blanc had actually accomplished this a little bit earlier in Europe. Uh, the other example that's often cited is Brunel's use of sealing blocks. All of this is around 1800. Sealing block is like the block in block and tackle where you're running, running uh, uh, sails up and down. Um, and in this case, modularity uh, had the purpose 
of making it easier to do mass production and, and repair by replacing broken parts. Um, as far as I can tell, these were not intended to enable innovative uh, reorganizations and reuses of the components. Um, an even earlier example of modularity is the, the, the small grain pieces of natural language. Um, the minimal unit varies by, letter, by, by language, whether it's a letter or a pictograph um, or a word. Uh, grammars provide the rules for assembling them, uh, and the composition rules may, may be by concatenation of the discrete element, where you can pull the elements out again, or it may be by, by recombining and blending, so that you, um, you do conjugations and you add endings and you add prefixes, and that's the reason that a dictionary is not sufficient for translating text from a language you don't understand because half the words you trip over uh, are inflected or prefixed or suffixed, and unless you can take them apart into their constituent elements, you can't figure out what they mean. Um, a third example, uh, which is not quite as old as language, uh, is money. Um, coins originally had intrinsic value um, as they came out of barter, and uh, notes seem to have a uh, um, a historical root in the receipts that the warehouse owner would give someone who deposited grain or some other goods in the warehouse uh, so that the receipt was a token for some amount of, of some commodity. Um, and so the, the value was, was uh, very, very strongly tied to the token. It was only when governments and banks began guaranteeing the value of those tokens that we arrived at currency as we know it today. Uh, but the point of currency is that um, if you have a goat and I have a pig, uh, we have to decide whether the goat is worth the same as the pig, and we don't have fractional goats and fractional pigs. Um, money gives us a set of abstract tokens so that we can um, abstract the value into a, into a common vocabulary, um, and then by, by counting out pieces of the, of the coins and notes, we can make up the value that we're seeking. Um, okay, enough of that. If we want to talk about modularity or understand modularity, um, I think it's, it's really, really helpful to be able to compare different kinds of modularity on the same basis. And as I said, to talk about modularity, let's talk about modules. And so I propose uh, this framework for describing modules to make them comparable. If, if you have a system for modularity, um, you ought to be able to ask of it, uh, what's the general scope? What's, what's the domain that it's trying to operate in? Um, how general or, or, domain spe or problem specific um, are the modules? Um, are the modules in your system homogeneous or are they of, of different kinds that have to be put together in particular ways? Uh, and how abstract and how general is the description? Um, second question, what's in a module? Uh, third, how do you figure out what goes into a module? Or how do you figure out where the module boundaries are, if you want to think about it that way? Um, fourth, how are the module definitions organized? And what relations may the definitions have to each other? Uh, and finally, uh, how do you combine modules to make other things? So I want to run quickly through a set of familiar examples just to get them cast into this vocabulary. Um, and these are examples of, of traditional modularity. Um, let's begin with functions and subroutines because <coughs> that takes us as about as far back as programming goes. Um, traditional functions and subroutines uh, have uh, capture functionality, but it's stateless functionality. Uh, the state exists someplace else. Uh, they're general purpose, they're homogeneous, um, and the abstract definitions match up with the concrete implementations. That is to say, the specification or the description or the program uh, for a function corresponds to a chunk of code, traditionally. So the content of a module is an algorithm um, which is then translated into code, so the abstract matches up with the concrete. Uh, the criteria that are generally used for identifying the functionality is that you localize reusable algorithms and you package up common functions uh, so that they'll be available for, for reuse as needed. Um, the organization is by hierarchical nested definitions, traditionally. 
and the composition is, is by, by function or procedure call. So if you want to combine functions, they call each other. Uh, now, this brings us up to the early 1970s with the, the Parnas inquiries into information hiding, uh, which led first to data abstractions and then by, by merger with, with the line of inheritance that, uh, that came out of small talk and, and simula to objects. So beginning with data abstraction, um, the idea here was to localize representation rather than to localize functionality. Um, they're still general purpose, they're still homogeneous, um, and the abstract definitions partly match the implementations. Uh, the, the, the code for the function still exists as functions, but the data itself um, lies, lies elsewhere. So there's a correspondence, but not an exact one. Um, the content uh, of a data abstraction is the, the representation of, of the, the data being abstracted together with the functions that are integrally tied to operating on that data. Um, and the criteria for selecting them are localizing representation um, and, and there's an invocation here of minimizing cohesion and coupling. Uh, uh, the organization is, is pretty flat. Uh, you may have nested functions within, but, but you tend not to have nested data abstractions. They may refer to other data abstractions, but from the, the standard definitions, it's a pretty flat space. And the composition uh, remains by function and procedure call. Uh, function and procedure call in which the identification of the data is passed about. Okay, enter objects. And what I've done here is highlight uh, the things that inheritance brought to the, ob to the data abstraction party. Um, the, the scope includes not just localizing representation, but managing variation. So the, the point of inheritance for me um, is that you have a set of related definitions and you can find a hierarchical organization of the variations. And inheritance allows you to, to describe that hierarchically by describing the differences rather than having a large, flat um, space of, of the full definitions. Uh, the content then includes not just the content of data abstractions, but the relative definitions or the deltas. And the organization becomes a hierarchical uh, inheritance organization. Now, since the original data abstraction organization was pretty flat, there's no problem with introducing hierarchy here. You, you kind of get one hierarchy in a system, and, and here's where that hierarchy comes in. <coughs> it wasn't already used up. Uh, composition is still by function and procedure call, though now they're dynamically bound. Um, and inheritance um, is also part of the composition scheme. Deep down under the covers, uh, it's function call, uh, but at the definition level, it's hierarchical inheritance. Um, the third example is concurrency. I think there's a slide missing. Um, I'll say it here. Um, <coughs> here, <coughs> I, I, I gave three reasons earlier for, uh, for using uh, modularity. And I'm, I'm not going through each of these examples and trying to identify the purpose because most of these have all three purposes. So in the case of, of data abstraction, um, the intellectual control is coming through, through localization. Um, the uh, segmentation of work is coming by taking different objects, putting them in different places, and letting, letting uh, uh, people with different expertise work on the different objects. Um, and the evolution and reusability comes from having the, um, the segmentation so that pieces can be replaced. Um, or you could turn those statements around and saying those purposes are served by, by these elements. So I'm, I'm not dwelling on um, the motivations, on the reasons for, for introducing modularity in these cases because all three of those reasons pretty much apply across the board. Uh, next example is concurrency. Um, and I'm thinking here about asynchronous concurrency via threads rather than fine-grained concurrency. So here the, uh, the, the scope uh, is asynchronous concurrency, uh, still general purpose, um, still homogeneous, and to a certain extent, to a large extent, the abstract and the concrete match. That is, you describe a thread, there is code for a thread. There's also synchronization code that keeps the threads from interfering with each other. 
but largely the abstract matches the concrete. The content of a thread is the algorithm that belongs in that thread together with the mechanisms that are required for synchronizing with other threads. Uh, the criteria for identifying the modules are to uh, um, uh, identify things that should be done as, as single computations and organize them into threads um, and, and to separate tasks to the greatest extent possible into separate threads. Um, the organization uh, is really pretty flat with interactions between the definitions and the composition is by synchronizing, for example, by data sharing uh, via locks or by other mechanisms. Um, another traditional example, one that's near and dear to my heart, um, is architectures, uh, which are coarse-grained system organizations um, that are general purpose, and now we have uh, organizations that are heterogeneous, uh, because when describing the architecture of a system, the components may be of very different kinds. Um, and in, in, the, in the most common cases, the architecture of a system matches the implementation of a system because the architectural elements correspond to compilation units. This need not be the case, but it's commonly the case. Uh, the content now is, is complete subsystems. Uh, so your, your, your components are at the scale of databases or processes or data streams or servers rather than individual functions or algorithms. Uh, the criteria um, for identifying them um, is either to take your problem and identify the, the large uh, areas of responsibility um, and recognize those as components of different kinds, or to say, I'm, I'm going to have an architecture of the following kind. How do I populate the components that I know I'm going to have with pieces from this problem? Um, the organization... Uh, recognizes different types of subsystems, but it's, it's uh, a flat organization within that. Uh, and the composition is by subsystem interaction. Um, and that, that itself is heterogeneous. There are many different kinds of protocols that are used for components to interact. Some of them are function calls, some of them are data flow, some of them are communication, um, some of them are data sharing. And the types of the components and the style of the architecture tell you which of those to use. So still in, in, in the traditional types of modularity, um, there are also some, some problem-specific strategies in which the modularity is given in advance and um, your task in exercising is to flesh that out. And the first example um, is um, actually architectural. Um, the, the MVC pattern or the MVC architecture says there are going to be three major subsystems. Um, there's going to be a model of you and a controller, and so um, you use this when you have uh, an interactive system that needs a user interface. Uh, it's a special purpose uh, modularity strategy. Um, the components are, are different from each other, so it's heterogeneous. Um, and um, largely the, the abstract pieces match the components. Um, the content um, well, there, there are three different kinds of components, and so they have three different kinds of content. The model has the algorithms for the system, the view has the user interface, and the controller has the mapping between them. Um, the criteria uh, are to separate the concerns underlying the model and its interactions, uh, and having, having decided on this particular architecture, you have a pretty clear uh, mandate for what you put in each piece. At least I used to think so, although I have seen some, some, some exercises of this that, that didn't have this sensibility and that, that, uh, that put a lot, of, a lot of things in places that I found really surprising. Uh, the organization is by uh, coordinating these, these definitions and the composition is, is, is stylized. You, you assign um, various responsibilities to the components that were selected in advance. Uh, and so that interaction was given to you as part of the, the template. And the, the other historical example of um, a modularization strategy comes to us from the text markup world, and uh, it dates to 90, 1981 with, with the scribe system. Um, it's a document markup uh, system. It's special purpose. The parts are different from each other, 
and it's interpretive. Um, so the idea is that the document and its markup should be one component, that the instructions about rendering or the style of the document should be a second component, uh, and the properties of the device, whether it be a line printer um, or a laser printer, um, those exist in a, a third component. And there's an interpreter that looks at all these descriptions and does a best effort rendering on the device um, to satisfy the style of the marked up document. So the document is marked up to say, uh, this, is, uh, this is emphasis, and the style says emphasis is boldface if possible, and the device says, I can't do boldface, I'm a line printer, and it says overprint then. Um, so the organization um, of the description of a particular document um, is three separate text documents, and the composition is by having an interpreter that applies the style and the device to the document markup. Remember that example because I'll come back to it. Now, I, I remarked earlier that you really get one shot at hierarchy in a system. Uh, if you need two hierarchies, then you have to find a way to make them interact. Um, if, the, the, uh, if, the, if the elements are independent, you can make this happen, but if there's a lot of interdependency, then you folks all know much better than I do how hard it gets uh, to make that work. Um, so module definitions are often organized hierarchically. It is a, a widespread, uh, historically significant, very useful approach, uh, but y you don't get many shots at it. So systems often have multiple distinct concerns, and uh, each Many of those concerns may have their own very, very reasonable document hierarchy or definition hierarchies. And <coughs> that leads us to trying to build language devices that address the structure clashes, such as aspects, multiple inheritance, flavors, and so forth. Uh, cross the, the very notion of cross cutting concerns is an explicit recognition of this problem. Um, and when the hierarchies are independent of each other or orthogonal to each other, this may work out really well. If not, um, then, then you face other challenges. And so I leave it as an exercise to each of you to think of the form of aspects that you work with and to try to cast that in the framework that I've just presented. So now I want to change the subject and, and talk about uh, where the world is going. So, I think there are two significant trends in the modern world that programming languages and software engineering have, have not been sufficiently responsive to. Uh, one is uh, the fact that a great deal of development is done by people who are not professionally trained as software developers. Uh, they are professionals at something else. They happen not to be professionals at software development. And the second is uh, uh, that uh, our traditional model of having discrete software projects that have managers and clear objectives is becoming uh, obsolete. More and more, we are developing software that exists um, in a, um, a world, specifically the internet world in most cases, uh, where there's a, a complex social and technical um, substrate uh, where the software is going to be used by, by people who are not trained in its use and where the software is enabling those people to do things that will, in fact, enhance the, the overall capabilities of the system. So the, the software and the people are, are intertwined, and many of those people who are actually doing development are not actually professional developers. So where does this take us? Well, first, <coughs> there are lots of, of end users. Um, we happen to have data for, for the North American, for the United States workplace, actually, uh, from the Bureau of Labor, Labor Statistics. And uh, an estimate we did a few years ago says that uh, over 90 million Americans will use computers at work by along about next year. Um, and odds are that um, probably half of them will be doing things that involve producing things that you might recognize as programs if you take a, a reasonably broad view. Uh, this does not include the non-US users, it does not include the home users, but even just taking that small sample, uh, there are something like two to two and a half million professional software developers, and there are maybe 50 million people who are not software developers who are developing software. 
okay? We're outnumbered out there. And we're not doing very much to help those other guys. Now, those other guys are not all alike. Uh, we also did a non-scientific survey. Uh, and I, I could tell you offline uh, the ways in which it is uh, suggestive rather than scientific. But it suggests that um, there are multiple types of end users. What, what this survey looked at was uh, what kinds of things um, information workers do with the applications in their offices. And where you might think that some of them would use spreadsheets and some of them would use databases, it turns out that they mostly use word processing and spreadsheets and databases, but they use them in different ways. Um, so there's some people that do macro sorts of things and some people that, that do uh, link structure sorts of things and some people that do imperative sorts of things. So this is sort of suggestive that people have different mindsets um, and that because of that they need different kinds of support. Um, now, for the most part, um, these folks are building uh, computation and information solutions out of things that exist on the internet. And what exists on the internet is not, I'm sorry, just function calls. It's not objects. Um, it's information. Uh, it's, yes, software that does calculation. Uh, it's a uh, mechanism for communication. Uh, it's control. It's services of various kinds. Um, <clears throat> these don't fall in the general rubric of the programming components that we mostly talk about. And not only that, but the properties of these resources are unlike the software units that we like to talk about. They're not like objects. They're autonomous in that they're independently created uh, and disseminated. Uh, and uh, many of them are used by people who um, haven't paid for them and haven't licensed them and are actually unknown to the proprietors of the, of the, the components. Uh, and so the stuff changes without notice. I mean, if, if the proprietor doesn't know you're using it, how can he notify you? Um, they are heterogeneous. They have different packagings. Um, their output is often for viewing only, although XML is tending to damp this out. More, more and more, um, you're able to extract information without actually doing a screen scraping. Um, they have different business objectives. They have different conditions of use. They have different assurances about their, their reliability, if any. Um, um, and they have open affordances. That is, um, they're independent systems, not dependent components. And it may be that the use that you find a for a component um, is unknown and unanticipated by whoever made it available to you. And that means that when they're trying to modify it, not only do they not know you're using it, but they don't know how you're using it. A and so there's no way that they can anticipate um, how, to, how you're using it so that they, they, there's no way that they can create changes that will, will be backward compatible with whatever it is you're doing. Um, so the incidental effects may be useful. And in some cases, uh, the humans may be integral. Let me elaborate those last two points. Um, when I was a child, um, I was told secondhand, because I'm innocent of things like this, that uh, the way you and your corner bookie settled the bet on the daily number, if, if you don't know what I'm talking about, then you're innocent too, so it's okay. Um, so the way you and your corner, your bookie settled the bet on, on, the, uh, uh, on the daily number was that you looked at the volume on the New York Stock Exchange and you looked at the last three digits which were about as random a draw as you could get at the time. And it was, it was something that was observable by everyone who got a newspaper. Remember, there was no internet when I was a child. So I, you know, I don't know this firsthand, but I'm told that, that this was the case. That's an example of an incidental use of something that was published for a different, very different purpose. Um, and I am also told that when the New York Stock Exchange realized this was happening, they started rounding uh, to a to a large enough rounding number that it was no longer random and the bookies had to find something else. Uh, humans are integral to some resources. Um, eBay wouldn't be eBay if there weren't people buying and selling. Facebook wouldn't be Facebook 
if there weren't people um, sharing pieces of their lives. Twitter wouldn't be Twitter if there weren't people You can make your own judgments about whether this is a good thing or a bad thing, but it's a thing. Twitter is only Twitter because people are... <laughs> so this, th this, is, this is the way the world is going. Um, the other theme is, th is the theme that's, uh, that's often labeled ultra-large-scale ultra systems. Um, uh, these are systems that are large in many dimensions, but that's not the point. Uh, uh, the point is that, that they're not just big, and not just that they're systems of systems in, in the sense of Mark Meyer. <coughs> uh, Meyer uh, argues that you build systems by taking things that were already designed and developed and fielded as systems, and you harness them together to make a new system. But as I read Meyer, He's still thinking about systems that have managers and crisp boundaries, um, and where the, the the system could be could, in principle, be specified, and where you could imagine uh, having a requirement for it that that laid out the particulars. Um, this says that the world as we know it goes beyond that um, into systems that have. Uh, there's a report from the Software Engineering Institute that, that lays this out in considerable detail. Um, Dick was a principal author of it. Um, operation is decentralized. There's no single person in charge. Think internet while I'm running through these examples. There, there's no one in charge of the internet. The internet is the internet because people have found the communication um, uh, infrastructure uh, sufficiently robust. They can put things on top of it that do... Um, things that were never imagined by other people. Um, there are conflicting and probably unknowable and diverse objectives and requirements. Um, not only do we have eBay and Facebook and Twitter, but the internet has enabled a, uh, a, another uh, set of capabilities in which um, alleged relatives of deceased uh, Nigerian dictators offer to share the fortune with me so that I can spend it on penny stocks and recreational pharmaceuticals. And all these opportunities come to me every day. <laughs> and uh, the network is about uh, 30 to 50 percent over provisioned in order to accommodate this traffic. Um, the the uh, networks of captive, uh, unprotected computers uh, that are being used to send to these communications are also a phenomenon that comes out of uh, the fact that we have a large, uh, a large complex, non-centrally managed system in which there are many people with, with different objectives, um, all pursuing their objectives uh, to, to good or to ill. Um, the systems evolve continuously. Uh, they have many different kinds of elements that change continuously, that are sometimes inconsistent with each other. Um, the boundary between the system and the people is indistinct. Uh, I mean, the internet is not just stringing wires. The internet is not just TCP IP. The internet is all of that plus the people who are buying and selling things on eBay um, and co-opting computers to send spam and communicating with each other through, through social media. It's all of that that makes the internet the internet, not just the underlying technology. Um, and there's a couple of other points that I don't think I need to dwell on here for this purpose of modularity. Um, to take that and, and try to, to drive it as an analogy that, that gives you some intuition, uh, think about city planning. Um, cities are complex systems. They're built out of individual components that are chosen by individuals. Uh, they evolve constantly. They withstand failures and attacks um, up to a large scale. Um, and we know from recent events that they're not completely immune. Um, but their cities are not, most cities are not centrally controlled. Um, they do have standards for their infrastructure. You, know, you're, you have building codes that say the buildings have to, have to be the strong. Um, you have rules that say the roads have to articulate in the following ways. Uh, 
You have policies that allow individual action within constraints, such as zoning laws. Let's say in this area you can build commercial things, in this area you can build high density residential things. Um, and you have um, some regulations that govern individual actions, but they, but, but they, they enforce after the fact. They notice that something has gone wrong um, and they, they sanction the offender. They don't prevent things from going wrong. They're resilient enough that for the most part, fixing things after the fact um, is a better solution than, than trying to legislate before the fact. Uh, there's a fine paper by, by Riddle and Weber uh, that describes uh, what are called wicked problems that characterize this kind of thing. Uh, one of the interesting things about that paper is that it begins with a two-page rag on people like us, um, uh, saying in effect that when, when analysts like us get in the business of city planning, uh, they look at the obvious things and they do specifications and requirements and, and, and technical stuff and they completely miss um, the, the social effects. Uh, and they wind up doing things badly. And in my city, there is a neighborhood that was absolutely destroyed in the 1970s by, by city planners uh, because they, they said, what we need is a neighborhood of the following kind. Let's put a ring road around it uh, and make the traffic stay out of the neighborhood. And what it did was dry up all the traffic to all the businesses and the, and the place died over a period of about 10 years. So um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a criticism of um, analysts like us getting involved in city planning that it would, I think we should all read and take to heart uh, when we start thinking about systems that are uh, social technical systems rather than purely technical systems. Um, anyway, out of those two trends, uh, I want to pick out some uh, modern modularity challenges or perhaps modern modularity opportunities. Um, and again, I'll pick up some, some general strategies and some problem specific strategies. So what are we doing about cloud computing? I mean, there's a bunch of people out there doing things about cloud computing, but are we thinking about modularity in cloud computing? Um, there are a lot of providers offering commodity grade computing services over the internet. So you can go to Amazon um, and you can buy four and a half gallons of computing power um, uh, to use at, at your discretion without having to go buy computers and configure computers and sysadmin computers um, uh, and you can, you can get four and a half gallons today and nothing next week and, and, and six liters the week after. Um, and they'll be happy to sell it to you just as they're happy to sell you warehouse space uh, for which they'll do fulfillment and shipping things out to you. Um, so you have distributed computing power, you have distributed storage, you have distributed applications, um, you have the notion of software as a service. Um, well, the cloud can be used in a lot of different ways, but one of the, one of the ways that's getting a lot of attention now is, uh, is service-oriented computing. And the idea here is that you're providing commodity services generally of the kinds that people use to run businesses. Uh, so this is, this is often, uh, often an enterprise uh, affair. I think it's often an enterprise affair in part because it's sufficiently complicated to make things work that only people who can afford data processing staffs can do it right now. Okay, opportunity looms. Uh, the content of a component in service-oriented computing um, is uh, fairly coarse-grained because the, the calling overhead is high. Uh, coarse-grained interchangeable computation and storage. And um, the criteria for what you put into a component uh, are that you're trying to get independent uses, units that support business processes. And usually they come with service guarantees. So that in the process of, of deciding to use one of these components, um, you organize a guarantee about the level of service. Um, this is one of the things that makes it heavyweight at the level of, of, uh, of you need to have an enterprise in order to, to exercise it. Uh, the organization is the, the, the definitions are distributed, but there are discovery services that let you, let you identify them and, and sign up for them. And the composition uh, is called orchestration, which is a hint that it's not easy. Uh, you have to uh, discover the services that you need. You have to establish contracts for their use. Uh, you have to marshal the data um, and, and cause interaction through a set of defined protocols. 
This is something that is now typically done um, as part of enterprise integration. Um, question, could we do something similar at a scale that makes it possible for real people to um, construct their own computations from things that are available in the cloud? I haven't touched privacy. I'm not going to touch privacy. I know it's out there. You know it's out there, but we don't have time to talk about it now. Um, second example is, uh, is modularity as we find it on the web. So how do you compose information um, when you're um, engaging the internet in, in your information and computation tasks? Well, you're, you're, running, uh, you're running a browser, you're running Photoshop, um, you're running a computation uh, system, you're running a word processor, and you augment its functionality by uh, add-ons, plugins, extensions, and, and other things of, uh, of, of other names but with similar, um, um, the, the, the idea is similar. And that is that you pick up a piece of functionality from someplace that is organized so that it will plug into the application that you're using. And then it, um, it might augment the functionality. It might provide a, a way of rendering different kinds of content. Um, it might do something as, as simple as, as changing the, 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 the rendering policy. That is, it might give you a theme. Uh, but, but those come from, from third-party marketplaces, where I'm taking marketplace to include giveaway as well as pay for. Um, and um, real people can use them. So they're extensions. They are of a format that's determined by the application they're augmenting. Um, and they're, they're discrete. They have to be discrete, because you're, you're picking them up um, and, and, and just just plugging them in. Um, another way that people compose information from the web uh, is by uh, opportunistic repurposing of things that are already out there. That is, you find three websites that have pieces of information you could use together, and you find ways to extract that information from those websites and put it together into a web page of your own. Uh, these are currently called mashups. Um, I think that's a word that suggests a really horribly messy process. Um, I think actually it's probably pretty accurate um, that mashups are, are pretty horrible. But I think there are a lot of opportunities to improve the situation. Um, and some progress is being made. The, the last time uh, I saw data, about half of the mashups were actually sitting on top of Google Maps um, doing uh, georeferencing for various, various kinds of data set. And that's getting to be fairly regular now. Um, so it deserves a better name than mashup. But the 50 million end users out there uh, deserve something better from us that allow them to do mashups without having to mash. Uh, web mod modularity, uh, um, also, I'm going to include smartphones as part of the web, because for the most part they are. Uh, the, uh, the things you find in an app store um, are, are modules. Um, mostly they're discrete, but sometimes they come in packages. So if you get a, 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 a translation component, there will be uh, voices that you can add to it, and there will be languages that you can add to it. So there, there is some structure there. Uh, the app stores like to claim many hundreds of thousands of, of applications. Um, I've done some, some hunting around for applications of particular kinds, and um, mostly they're junk. Um, but this is what you would expect. Um, if, you have, if you have an open market like that, there's, there's going to be a lot of junk in it. The trick is how do you find the few things that, that rise to the top? And what you're using right now is, is user ranking systems, but <coughs> I, I think that's a weak mechanism. So there's opportunity there. Um, then we have the participatory web, uh, called Web 2.0, uh, with user-generated content and the network as a platform. Um, I've looked at Facebook. Um, I've tried to understand Facebook. 
Um, architecturally, Facebook is a disaster. Um, the, the difference between initiative, am I pulling or pushing, uh, the relationship between different kinds of pages, um, it seems to change every few months. It's hard to find out what the motivations are. And this doesn't even touch the, the addition of applications and games, for which there's, there's also a, a security problem. Um, that world, the, the, um, uh, the world of consumer-grade social networking, could really use some guidance uh, about how to organize things so that uh, people could configure their own, so that the parts are consistent with each other, um, so that um, the initiative and the durability and the persistence was intelligible. I mean, there's just all kinds of reasons why, why that world could use our help. It doesn't get our help because we don't think it's respectable. We don't pay any attention to them. What do we expect is going to happen? Um, and then we, we have the semantic web, uh, or web 3.0, coming down the line at us. Uh, here you have massively annotated data and data fusion. And some of the interesting applications there are taking, for example, government data sets um, that have extensive meta information um, and doing integration of data, uh, data sets from multiple places that, that reveal trends and phenomena that aren't evident from the individual data sets. So let's just look at the semantic web. Um, the scope here is, is annotated data, and the, the aspiration is for um, free-form natural text annotated data. I, I think the current success stories are for highly structured data uh, that, has, that has meta information that lets you interpret the, the, the tabular uh, data. Um, they're general purpose, um, they're homogeneous, and they aspire to semantic abstraction, but I don't think they've made it yet. Um, uh, the content of, of each component, um, and I, I want to focus on the success stories, which are data sets. Um, data set with, with meta information. It might be tabular data. Uh, it might be mapping data. Um, but, but for the moment, let's focus on, on making modules that have data sets that, that have extensive metadata. What goes into a component is the related data. Um, and the criteria are that the data came to you in some natural form. You're not restructuring the data from its natural form, but you provide metadata that, I, that allows you to identify the individual parts. Um, and the organization is driven by ontologies that purport to explain the data. Uh, one of the places where I think the, the semantic aspiration has not been um, achieved yet is the kinds of anomalies you can get by doing statistical comparisons where the same term is used in different ways in different places. Um, and so uh, if robbery is defined in one way in one country and has a, a different definition in another country, there may be a much higher standard of malevolence uh, involved in one country than the other. And then you'll get very different uh, apparent rates of robberies just because the definition is different, the classification is different. So I think that's one of the ways in which the, the aspiration to semantics has not yet been achieved. Um, the composition is, is through data interchange formats, um, matching the tags that are used to establish correspondence. And this is the ontology problem, that if the tag and the ontology uh, doesn't mean the same thing in all places, then anomalies will come out. So, so there's, there's modularity there, and I think there are opportunities. Um, I don't want to dwell on these examples, but there are, there are some, some opportunities in architectural integration as well. Um, software architecture is moving beyond standalone systems uh, to distributed compositions of existing components. Uh, there's an EU project called Connect, uh, whose purpose is to do general integration of heterogeneous components, that is to, to find components in the wild to understand them uh, to, to the point they can put a wrap around them so that they can make them interoperate uh, with other components. Um, and uh, medical informatics in the United States, uh, there's currently a big push uh, to do interoperability and integration of medical records. Um, and I know of 
um, I know of, of some details of, of systems in three European countries uh, as well. So the, uh, there are there's some serious issues about appropriate granularity, about maintaining appropriate meta information, and in particular about maintaining context. Um, so the context in which a medical test is done may be very important to interpreting that 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 uh, uh, that medical record, and um, they're still trying to think through the level at which you can make things granular, and the the means of of, of maintaining context. And uh, then I want to turn to some some very problem specific modularity strategies. Um, one is Yahoo Pipes, which I think is kind of cute. Um, the idea is uh, that there that it only addresses data feeds. When it was originally released a few years ago, it only addressed RSS feeds in particular, and, and it's gone beyond that to other kinds of data feeds. Um, its special purpose in that all it does is aggregate and filter data feeds. Um, it's homogeneous in that all it does is data feeds. Um, and uh, the, the abstract and, and the concrete match up because you have data feeds coming in, you talk about them as data feeds, you manipulate them as data feeds. So the content um, is that you get RSS feeds or, or similar data streams, um, and they're already modularized for you, for you because for Yahoo Pipes, you take data streams that exist in the wild and you operate with them. Uh, and the criteria is that you use the feed as it comes to you, um, but it only supports data feeds. Not attempting to be general, if it's if it's not coming as a as a series of, of individual uh, units, they're not interested. Um, the organization, I have I have found it terribly hard to find uh, pipe definitions. Um, I I haven't tried to use it recently, but when I was trying to use it, there was a there was a search mechanism where you could search for what you thought people might be using as keywords, and you could scroll through all maybe thousand of them one by one, and I found it really unhelpful. Um, but, but the composition is beautiful. There's a visual interface that makes you think about water pipes and plumbing, in which you bring the feeds in, and then you have uh, junctions that will do various kinds of merging and filtering, and so you can say, um, take the Craigslist feed from, from San Francisco and show me all of the apartments for rent uh, in the zip code. And you can do that fairly easily. Or, or you can say, take Craigslist and these other uh, local information sources and feed them all together and show me all the apartments for rent within the zip code. So it's, it's really pretty slick for the thing it's trying to do. Um, now I want to go back to Scribe, because web page definitions um, repeat the Scribe phenomenon. Uh, and so the, those criteria remain viable. You separate the document definition into a tagged document and a style and a rendering. And what we have in web pages is that the web page is the annotated document. You know, HTML is a markup language, right? So you have a document that's marked up. Um, the CSS file or a template or a content management system is providing the style, uh, and the browser is responsible for the rendering. Um, and <coughs> one of the most frustrating kind of web pages for me is the one in which the author of the HTML has decided to preempt the privilege of my browser to display the material as I, as I would like to see it. Um, so there's a, there's a confusion of modularity that is Dick will tell me sometimes deliberately violated, and I'm okay with that. It's when it's accidentally violated uh, that it really drives me berserk. So there's a lot of opportunity here. Um, the big one for me is that the web page itself incorporates the document markup uh, and, the, and the document text, but there's also algorithm buried there, and there's state and structure information buried there. And getting the algorithm, the markup, the text, uh, and, and the state management separated from each other in an intelligible way would be a really important piece of progress. Um, we have a couple of examples of, of large-scale fine-grained parallelism. Um, one is MapReduce, which is tightly synchronized that allows you to take a 
something like a search problem, farm it out to a lot of different servers, and combine the results. Another is grid computing with volunteered resources. You know SETI at home? Yeah, you know the prime factorization? Okay, there, there's, there's um, um, uh, an organization out of Berkeley called Boink that sets up the software for doing big scientific computations like this. And the idea is that people provide uh, cycles on their, on their own computers of various kinds when the computers aren't busy. The problems get chopped up into pieces, farmed out, um, and the results recombined. And the farming out is done in a robust way so that if my, my computer goes west, then the fact that it didn't complete its computation doesn't, doesn't bother the, the whole. So there's, there's currently uh, two and a half million users, six million hosts, and over 200 countries involved in, in these projects. Um, so there's a, there's a big uh, um, parallelism enterprise out there. Um, so kind of winding up, uh, what I did was propose a, a framework for discussing modularity. And I walked you through a number of examples in which I apply this framework. Um, along the way, I pointed at a number of different kinds of, of stuff that might be in a module. So we're talking about modules, right? What goes in a module? Um, all of this might be in a module. And the modules are going to have a different character depending on uh, what you put in them and what you intend to use it for. Um, along the way, I identified a number of different types of composition. And, and I'm not reading these to you because almost all of them have been mentioned already. Um, so there are a lot of different ways to put things together. Some of them preserve the discrete character of the modules. Uh, some of them don't. Um, but note that these types of composition are abstractions. In the current technology, deep down under the covers, most of it's actually accomplished by procedure calls. Um, so procedure call is kind of the assembly language. Um, and constructs like this are the higher level language. If we can, if we can conduct our discourse uh, at this level, uh, we'll be much better able to make distinctions than if we say, oh yeah, there's function calls down there. Because yeah, there's function calls. That's, that's the assembly language in, into which everything is mapped. OK, uh, now what about this framework? Um, uh, Fred Brooks, who is one of my favorite software engineers, in his incarnation as an HCI guy, uh, proposed recognizing that there are different kinds of results that are, that are interesting in science, uh, and that they have different criteria for quality. Um, there, are, there are findings, which are well-established facts that are judged by their truthfulness and rigor, and that's what we try to get in our research publications. Um, but he argues there are also other things that, that are, are worth discussing, even if they're not findings. There are observations, which are report on, on actual phenomena that are judged by how interesting they might be. There are rules of thumb, which are generalizations that somebody believes in enough to, to sign them, but maybe they're not fully supported by data. And they're judged by whether they're useful. Um, and freshness is a criterion that applies to all of them. So says Brooks in a, a, a long ago paper in an HCI conference. So the framework that I have, that I've showed you today is certainly not a finding. Um, however, I'm offering it to you as, as a rule of thumb, um, that is, as a, as a generalization that I hope is useful um, and that I hope uh, will provide a basis for discussion of modularity um, as AOSD moves on into uh, to thinking about new opportunities. And uh, as I said early on, my objective is to offer this framework uh, to open a discussion about modularity. Uh, but I also wanted to call out some particularly interesting opportunities uh, to go beyond code addressing problems uh, that real users have in the real interactive and connected world. Thank you. Okay. Thank you <laughs> very much, Mary, for the excellent talk. <laughs> questions? The student volunteers in the back, they, they, they have the microphone for questions. Speechless. As Paulo Barba says, I'm always making questions. Uh, but one question is, all, all your talk is about uh, 
computing itself. But computing is a means to an end and not, a, not the end in itself. So one of the problems we have, for instance, with ontologies is that, uh, well, there are several ontologies which address the same problem, but they don't communicate in a proper way because they have different terms and we still are bound to names. But we are also bound to uh, cultures. There are different laws, there are different uh, ways of thinking and so on. How, how can we overcome this kind of uh, difficulties? Uh, the question, I believe, is that um, in trying to provide support for computation, um, we're really supporting people to achieve their objectives rather than to do computation in its own right. And that those objectives are um, distinguished by context where, where you cited cultural context as a particular context. Um, and where not only the assumptions, but also the operating environment or the regulatory environment may be different. Um, good question. Um, that question arises, of course, because we have moved out of, uh, of, of computing as a sequestered activity into computing in the world. Um, and uh, I think the most important first step is for us to recognize that it's not all a technology problem, which, which is implicit in your question. Um, but I think that recognition uh, is not universal across our field. So, so that, would, that would be step one. Um, step two would not be to try to formalize all of those assumptions and fold them into the, the, the technologies that we're comfortable with. Because I, I think evidence is that, that they don't lend themselves to that. Um, we need to become um, more aware of those issues. In most cases, we will want to involve people whose professional uh, background helps them to interpret those issues for us. But in developing our software, we need to make provisions for um, adaptation um, that will accommodate the different settings. Um, so if, if we think of uh, software development as the development of a, in our terms, a product line, um, then that will remind us that we need to provide the variability um, that allows us to, to um, the, the easy examples are things like, like different language settings, uh, different regulatory settings, uh, one of my favorite examples at home is that the United States privacy laws are very different from the European privacy laws. And someone who's setting up a database in the United States and then intends to export it to Europe is likely to discover that they haven't built in sufficient um, tracking information to accommodate the, the, the European data privacy laws. And, and I recognize that that's a, a North American, European-centric example, but it's, it's one that I happen to have. Um, uh, I think this is probably old hat in the HCI community, but if you're designing a visual interface um, and decide to make it multilingual, it's not just a matter of switching in a language module, because the layout has provided a certain amount of space for a certain amount of text. And even linear letter-oriented languages take different amounts of space, uh, but when you move to, uh, to pictographic languages, um, the amount of space you have provided and the orientation of the space is, is, is likely to be unsuitable. Um, so um, first, recognizing that there's an issue. Um, second, in involving people who, who understand those issues. Um, and third, trying to design software so that, um, that it anticipates the kinds of changes that would be reflected. That won't solve the problem, but it will get us down the road. More questions down the back? Um, 
So the question uh, is, is whether the framework that I suggested for modules is a suitable framework for cross-cutting concerns. Um, I wouldn't have any reason to believe that it is. Um, because there's, uh, there's no point in it uh, for identifying the, um, the, the clashes. So what I, I, did, I did indeed call out structure clashes as, as an impediment to um, merging multiple points of view and multiple hierarchies. Um, I, would, I would suggest um, an exercise that's, that's similar to, to what I did, which is to, uh, to line up examples of these structure clashes. Um, and to try to understand what they have in common and how they differ, and to let a framework for describing uh, those clashes emerge from that. Okay, we still have time for one more question. Someone here, Harold. Uh, well, one, one of the, um, the reasons I cited for establishing modularity um, was, in fact, intellectual control. And um, you cite that also in your question. Um, and you cite particularly intellectual control in the form of segmenting the reasoning so that it matches the, the, the segmentation of the, of the system. Um, and... Uh, you ask if I have anything non-obvious to say about it. Uh, the obvious thing being, um, of, of, of course, when you set criteria for putting things in modules, those criteria will, will include the, the criteria for doing the reasoning. Um, so, so do I have anything more to say than, than that obvious? Um, one of the things that, I learned over the years in the area of software architecture was that different architectures have different styles of reasoning. Um, so functional composition uh, works for architectures where the, the connection uh, protocols are functional. Um, functional composition, um, to my slight surprise at the time, turns out to be just the right thing for uh, the particular form of data flow that's reflected in Unix pipes. Uh, because if, if you're pumping data into um, filter F um, and then pumping the result into filter G, then what comes out is G of F of input. Um, but um, network communications, I think, lend themselves more to, uh, to network analysis, duh. Um, the kind of reasoning that's used for large data-centered systems like databases is reasoning that's driven by the acid properties of databases. Um, let's see if I can reconstruct acid. Um, help me, somebody. Um, these are the, the synchronization, synchronization properties of, of, of databases. No one, no one can help me? ACID. Well, oh, atomicity, um, consistency, I integrity, and transactionality. No. Oh, D, 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 D. Durability. Durability. Okay. So I haven't I haven't swapped that in in a long time, Harold. Uh, but but what we saw in architecture was that um, different. Isolation. Yeah, uh, one, of the thing, one of the things we, we found in, in software architecture was that different kinds of architectures had a different kind of natural reasoning uh, that came out of the, the kind of problem that led to the architecture itself. Um, and so um, I, I do believe that there needs to be uh, specification of some kind uh, along with the, the componentry. 
Um, but I don't believe that it needs to be of the kind that we have traditionally used uh, for, for functional systems. And <clears throat> I add, um, I don't want to be too hard over on having specifications for those components. Because the evidence is that if you think the specifications for bespoke software components um, are iffy, you ought to see the specifications for the stuff that comes off the web. You know, when, when you're running Thunderbird and you download a plugin, it doesn't come with a specification. It just is. And somehow we managed to survive it. So in addition to um, having uh, specifications and compositional reasoning for those cases where the application is of significant significance that we can justify it, um, I think we also need to look for lower ceremony ways of gaining confidence um, about systems that aren't going to have those specifications. And and if we're going to serve the world at large, we're going to have to cast those assurances in, in ways that they understand. So, um, there's an organization in the United States called the Pew Foundation that has a long-running project called the Internet in American Life. And I don't have the slide handy, so I don't have the numbers, but uh, a very substantial fraction of the U.S. population looks for health uh, information online. Um, and the fraction of internet users who have health conditions uh, who look for information online is even higher, not surprisingly. But only a minuscule fraction of these people who go online looking for health information, presumably for making decisions of their own, only a minuscule fraction of those attempt to validate the sources that they're using. And that's scary. Um, so. Um, I'll pose a question back to you that you can take home. Um, how could Watson be improved? Um, I mean, to me, to me, the genius of Watson is the ability to take a, a wide body of information of variable quality and to draw from it um, conclusions with, with uh, an asserted level of confidence. How could that technology be applied to information on the web so that when I'm browsing for stuff on the web, I had a guy sitting on my shoulder saying, eh, not that one, or look over there, or the thing that you have just done, you should be this confident in. So I offer you that question to take home. Okay, thanks a lot again, Mari.